So this morning, our presenter is Dr. Spencer Thomas, and his theme, his topic of discussion or presentation this morning is credit union in a changing climate. So let me tell you a little bit more about Dr. Thomas. Dr. Thomas, PhD, Grenada's Ambassador and Special Envoy for Multilateral Environmental Agreements in the country's lead negotiator and the country's lead negotiator for climate change and biodiversity. He is a former financial secretary and economic policy advisor in the Ministry of Finance, Grenada. Dr. Thomas holds a, doc a doctorate in energy economics, master's and bachelor's degrees in economics and a postdoctoral master's degree in telecommunications, regulation, and policy. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow co-opters, make him welcome this morning. Send something in the chat. Dr. Spencer Thomas, welcome to the main stage. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Katrina, for this very kind introduction. And good day, good morning to everyone. And, and let me begin by um, offering my words of congratulation to the awardees and the, um, to Iran, to Brian, and to Peter for, for their performance this morning. Thank you very much. Let me also say thank you for your kind invitation to the 63rd Annual Convention of CCCU and to speak at this event here today, albeit virtually. I agree with Alex Ihama that credit union was built to last. This conference is a testimony of this. I am happy to speak on this most important topic of credit unions in a changing climate. This topic is situated in a most appropriate theme, building resilience through self-reliance. I understand that this is the final plenary and after listening to the, the conference during the course of the week, I thought I should reiterate and wrap some of the basic messages relevant to this topic in this presentation. Whenever I hear about building resilience and changing climate, I immediately refer to the phenomenon of climate change and the international climate change diplomacy and negotiations. This question of, claim of credit unions in a changing climate, however, goes beyond this. Climate change is only one important factor contributing to a changing climate. Yes, the climate has changed and is changing to a new state, which is referred to as the new normal. Some people say it's the next normal. I thank Dr. Jaja for highlighting that the future is not an extension of the past. I heard that very clear. The future is not an extension of the past. That is a quote she had processed. A new state due to the fact that we are exceeding planetary boundaries and tipping points for key ecosystems and processes, including financial ecosystems and processes. We are, in fact, on the right side of the bell curve. It is clear that climate is changing due to the current pandemic. Chairman Moses said COVID-19 has upended the world, rightly so. Irreversible change, he said, to the way we live, the way we walk, the way we play, think, behave, and act. Well said. The climate is changing due to the impact of climate change. Of course, due to the impact of the loss of biological diversity and natural ecosystems, due to environmental degradation, and coupled with all of this, socioeconomic socio crises of various kinds, debt crisis, fiscal crisis, financial crisis, energy crisis, all of these are accompanying some of those degradation and crises. It is also clear that the climate is changing due to revolutionary changes in the digital technologies 
in applications and services. The rapid pace of change in the digital economy is undisputed. Everywhere, information, communication, technologies abound. It is also clear that the climate is changing due to changes in behavioral patterns, due to changes in demands and expectations from members and other key stakeholders. It is clear that the financial sector, where credit unions as financial cooperatives, and we were reminded about this this morning, where financial, um, where the credit unions as financial cooperatives spend most of the time, that this sector is heavily impacted. I will therefore argue that crime credit unions must be cognizant of these changes and be agile and, and be imbued with the flexibility to remain relevant to achieve the stated objectives, including sustained livelihoods for its members. Honorable Prime Minister Motley used the terminology adapt pivot. I also heard Judy McCutcheon also wading on this subject and she used the terminologies adaptive, agile, and unified. And several speakers endorsed this concept during the course of this week. The message is agility must be inscribed in the DNA of credit unions. Indeed, we are now in quite a unique era in the history of humanity. And I repeat, we are in an era marked significantly by the COVID-19 pandemic. Unprecedented changes in the climate system. Unprecedented loss in biological diversity and species abundance. Unprecedented environmental degradation and accompanied by all of this is socio-economic crises of multiple kinds. Therefore, green climate resilient recovery is now a dominant paradigm. Credit unions must embrace the green agenda. Prime Minister Motley quite forcefully indicated issues on this point, calling for investments and support for green initiatives, including funding for green energy. It is no secret that the compound crises and associated impacts constitute an existential threat to the ethos and philosophy of credit unions that we just heard about from the president and from Brian, and also from the chairman. It is also clear that it is an existential threat to our livelihoods, our economies, our countries, and our regions. This state of compound crisis is what in the social planning literature is referred to as a wicked problem. The literature defines wicked problem as multi-dimensional challenges that are difficult to resolve due to complex interactions with other issues, multi-discipline, multi-dimensional challenges, difficult to resolve due to complex interactions, a wicked problem. Each of the crises mentioned can be described as a wicked problem. I leave it up to you to categorize the compounded nature of this problem. All I will say, it is a wicked problem cocktail. Not a smoothie all the way as we had this morning. Not, not Katrina's potluck. It is a wicked problem. Um, in the midst, let us take, for instance, the case of our neighbor, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as an example. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, with the government announcing significant fiscal constraints that might even affect the payment of salaries. With escalating debt at the same time, 
with the impacts of climate change, natural disasters, and loss of biodiversity being felt at the same time. Then comes devastating volcanic eruptions, volcanic ashfall, Sahara dust. Then entered excessive rainfall and flooding and damage to critical infrastructure. And the backdrop of all of this is that at that time, we were one month away from the next hurricane season, which is predicted to be very, a very active one. And at the same time, the memory of the last hurricane in the region still lingered. This is a wicked problem cocktail indeed, and not a smoothie. The proposed fixes for this cocktail was basically universal vaccination to get us back and adherence to the protocols to reduce impacts, to reduce dependence on fossil fuels and the elimination of climate forces, to decarbonize our economies, decarbonization of our economies and structures, to conserve and sustain use of our biodiversity, to adhere to the agenda for sustainable development and the achievement of the sustainable development goals. These are the rallying cry, the global rallying cry. How are we doing? The jury is out. We just had the G7 meetings and they made some communiques. We had the subsidiary bodies of the Climate Change Convention and the Biodiversity Convention meeting just this last week. Um, we have the meetings of the IPCC and the IPBES, the scientific bodies for those conventions, including the International Energy Agency and so on, all concluding that we are not on target. So I think we may need to go back to Dr. Jaja and look for a global leader shift, as she put it. I, I really like that terminology. I think it is quite appropriate in this in the environment. I want to argue, therefore, that building resilience in part true self-reliance, the conference team, is quite appropriate. Enhancing our adaptation capacity, addressing our biodiversity issues, addressing loss and damage as a consequence of climate change, Ensuring that we have ensuring that we have targeted flows of finance, development, and climate finance. These are now imperatives for us in the region as we endeavor to recover and to achieve sustainable development. The SDGs implementation. While the international community through the multilateral process has elaborated and agreed on several frameworks. Credit unions as financial cooperatives have a defined role to play to prepare the members for this changing climate. COVID-19 has reinforced the importance of the digital economy and electronic communications. COVID-19 coupled with the crises stated above have changed the operating landscape for credit unions in a fundamental and I dare say prominent manner. There will be no business as usual. Indeed, COVID-19 has shown that what has been deemed impossible is now a prominent reality. Having removed from the economies of the region the fiscal space, and we heard a lot about this, the fiscal space and flexibility for discretionary investment. COVID-19 plus, including the crisis I'm talking about, has crippled the economies. COVID-19 has immobilized, to some extent, the financial sector as business disruptions, moratoria, 
and forbearance are now the order of the day. What does the future hold on this is all of us guess. But coping with the pandemic has been a great challenge and continues to be so. We have now seen and are now experiencing fully entrenched virtual engagements, working from home and the acceleration and the use of digital technology. We are now at a juncture where it is safe to say that without digital transformation, there is no recovery and hence no growth and development and enhancement of our livelihoods. The use of technologies will be decisive for the green and sustainable recovery. Development of digital applications, e-government, e-commerce, e-everything are the current opportunities available to boost the economies of our region. Credit unions ought to be on board with this COVID-19 inspired and catalyzed digital explosion. There is no need to fear that digitization will be capital intensive. In fact, while there is need for establishment of modern digital infrastructure, the key factors will be the need for regional expertise, indigenous innovations, and inclusive and meaningful participation. While the public sector and government are responsible for the enabling environment, the legal, regulatory, and institutional frameworks, and governments and the private sector for hardware infrastructure, I argue that credit unions ought to invest in members' education, software infrastructure, and initiatives that complement and promote the digital explosion. Building local and regional capacity to fully benefit from the digital economy is the business of all stakeholders. Credit unions, business models must be adjusted and reconfigured to accommodate the infusion of digital technologies. Remote working and engagement, digital payments, cloud services, digital identification, privacy, data protection, cybersecurity, cybercrime, all these are here to stay. And I heard a lot of some of this during the course of this week already from David and Michelle. Machine to machine applications, business to business solutions, distributed ledger technologies, blockchain, artificial intelligence, automation, digital ID and facial recognition are the ways of the future, no doubt. There will be, therefore, an imperative to build the capacity and engender trust building initiatives to actively participate in this new and emerging digital dispensation. Credit unions cannot be left behind. Credit unions must act to reduce the digital divide of the members by targeting investments in that new capacity landscape. Investments must be made to acquire and encourage new skills and knowledge. This new dispensation means that credit unions must assume an enhanced risk-based approach to doing business. Look at the opportunities that are, are available. Not only the risk, but also the opportunities. The technology risks in particular must be thoroughly assessed and internalized in the business models. Stress testing must be institutionalized. The regulatory regime must be reviewed. Investments must be pursued in innovative instruments 
like deposit insurance, cyber insurance, indemnity insurance, parametric insurance, critical, derivatives, and other innovative instruments. The pioneering work of Creed in Dominica on parametric insurance offerings, including flexible hurricane protection at the micro and meso levels must be applauded. This is a perfect example of building resilience through self-reliance. Of course, they are in uncharted territory, territories. And of course, I understand that they are in partnership with credit unions there. Such an initiative, I think, should be rolled out across our region as a perfect example of building resilience to self-reliance. In addition to cybercrime, anti-money laundering legislation, combating terrorist financing, FATCA obligations, these are major concerns for us in this sector. General data protection regulation is another major area of, of, of concern. We have heard and seen what the UK and, and the, the, the EU governments have done in terms of the obligations posed on, on, the, on, on, the, on the globe in terms of their unilateral imposition of their data protection regulations. We have seen the same happening in the US. And of course, we have just recently seen efforts to do the same in, in our region. So this is a very critical area. This area is also need to conform to new accounting standards. And I think we have, again, some discussions on that during the course of the week. IFRS, the Basel 2 and 3. In, in short, the point here is that credit unions must be equipped to handle all of these things that are happening to us in this global, in this changing environment. Credit unions can best be advised also to routinely complete a comprehensive mapping exercise to capture changes in behaviors, expectations, and demands from among its membership. This is critical to remain relevant. For example, the question can be asked whether credit unions are prepared to lend to a youthful entrepreneur who has an idea but does not have the necessary collateral. No track record, no sponsor, 16 year olds with a fantastic idea. Are we going to count the risk? Are we going to look for the opportunity? We need to look at these cases. Of course, with the ethos and philosophy of the credit union movement at its full. Credit unions are powerful entities that play a critical role in economic stability in the countries in which they operate and in the region as a whole. Again, I want to go back. The ladder builder and the ladder extender analogy, again, is here. And again, as borrowing from yesterday, excellent presentation that credit unions has a role as a ladder builder and a ladder extender. In some cases, credit unions are even bigger and are deeper than some commercial banks. Notwithstanding this situation, there is a need for operational consolidation. The definitive call for working together on regional approaches is therefore deafening. While there are, of course, elements of competition among credit unions, it behooves credit unions to organize as a single unit to confront and be responsive to the changing environment, both nationally and regionally. A new lexicon, co-opetition, which is cooperation and competition, comes to mind, which calls for heightened cooperation while engaged in healthy competition. I think this is, this is the way to go. Working together is essential for enhanced efficiency of the movement, for effectiveness 
and for a healthy bottom line. Working together maximizes impact, maximizes the power, the influence, and the self-determination of the credit union movement. Working together will address the theme of this conference and build resilience through self-reliance. So I would like to conclude at this point. And to conclude to say, and to reiterate, that we are in unprecedented times and the climate is changing in fundamental ways. The changes continue to take place at unprecedented rates, necessitating the establishment of a new state, which is the new normal. Clear, definitive responses are needed by the credit unions as the financial institutions that are closest to the most marginalized in our societies. The key elements of this response must include education and awareness, agility and nimbleness to act, we heard pivot, mark departure from a business as usual scenarios, investments in digital capacity, determination of new models and new modes of delivery, enhance risk-based approaches and stress testing, and an approach for regional operational consolidation. I have to agree, admit that these elements do not together constitute a panacea, but are deemed necessary and indispensable in the new and emerging dispensation. So therefore, let us invest in innovative and indigenous models to build resilience to self-reliance in this changing climate. I thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thomas. And of course, very insightful, direct and comprehensive presentation, Dr. Spencer Thomas. And of course, he presented on credit union in a changing environment. So I have a few takeaways. As we build resilience, we must address biodiversity issues, target flow of finance as we endeavor to attain sustainable development, COVID changed the operating landscape of credit unions. It is no longer business as usual. Credit unions must be on board for the digital explosion. And as a movement, we must build locally, regionally, or build the capacity locally and regionally to benefit from the digital explosion. Thank you again. Thank you very much for your presentation.